Hi everyone, it's your boy Zach, and I feel like I'm dismantling a bomb. This comiXology has been crashing on me all day long. I'm trying to get ahead on videos for the next few days so I can rest after surgery, and uh, it's crashing every couple minutes. So anyway, uh, this is from Extinction Agenda. Um, I decided to just review the X-Men uh, issues because those are the best art. That's where really everything happens. It's essentially the, it's nine parts, but the X-Men is where all of the major plot points happen. And in the other issues of New Mutants and X-Factor, it's like, they escape. <laughs> they get captured and then they escape. Well, why don't you just have them not have them captured at all? Because they can get captured in one place and escape in a different place and then meet someone in a third place. So uh, Chris Claremont is not juggling 40 characters in a storyline on every page. Although, quite frankly, I think he could handle it. That being said, I will never stop being annoyed at this shit. This box right down here. Uh, at the time when this came out in 1990, I think it was. Um, it would have either had a barcode or it would have had like a 25th anniversary of this or just a picture of Spider-Man, something like that. The decision to just fill it in black is just idiotic. Uh, so it starts off with this Dramatis Personae which would be done usually in special events, annuals and stuff like this. This was a motif that Chris Claremont had. There's a bunch of stuff here. It's um, uh, Genosha was their version of South Africa discussing apartheid with mutates. Those were people who had gene potential to maybe have mutants in their, in their family sometime. Not exactly mutants, but then they would be put through a process and turned into slaves. So they have been, ca oh, I can't, I can't explain all the subplots. I can't, the good guys got captured by bad guys and the other good guys are going to go rescue them in their evil land. Uh, but here's where it gets really interesting. First of all, the art is just freaking fantastic. Although there are some eccentricities like, um, it looks like she has a talking gun <laughs> right here. But, um, uh, you see this fantastic art. This is, uh, Jim Lee and Scott Williams. The previous one had a mix of Art T. Bear and Scott Williams on inks. And I always find it frustrating when I don't know who did what. So this is all Scott Williams. Uh, so it's a fantastic action. Uh, you're seeing uh, Jim Lee really becoming the huge power force that he was in the industry. I got to say, if you've read his stuff in the last 20 years, you, it ain't even close. Uh, you don't understand how much this electrified uh fans when we saw art styles like this like this just absolutely blew my mind although i am noticing something i don't like these um color tangents so she's got this uh stun stick and uh wolverine was going through a storyline where he was losing his powers so he was a lot easier to defeat so you could just hit him with a electric baton and he'd be out but you get this great contrast of these darker panels and then you see, okay, so it's got the electricity, it's blinding white, but then you also got that in this one, this little blue energy right here, I would have filled it, all this area that's white right here, I would have filled it with the blue. So the, uh, this is, um, actually, there we go. <laughs> it's been doing this literally all day. I mean, technically I can edit this out, but you know, I got a lot of stuff to do, so. Let's see if it goes back to the, I know people say that the app works better, but I don't use it that much. And I feel like it's 2022 and websites should work. Uh, so then they, you know, some of this is very plotty, you know, we're capturing the bad guys and we're going to wear their uniform, their uniforms to sneak into the Citadel. Uh, but there's some stuff I like right here. I mean, he's balancing a lot of different characters. You have these team characters, some of whom haven't met each other yet. And they're not just like, we're frenzies. Like they're, you know, it's kind of like new kid in school. Like uh, it's not only that uh, Jubilee doesn't know them, but there's a dynamic between her and Wolverine and she's jealous of anyone coming in between. I'm still shocked that like, uh, thanks for the helping hand, sir. Are you part of a larger rescue force? I, I'm just used to like teenagers always talking to adults like they're assholes in media. So it's kind of shocking to see a teenager call a man sir and like ask him like hey you know what's the plan so we get a nice uh, montage of the you know psychic interrogation I guess you'd say 
which actually gets you caught up on stuff that happened in the other issues that were not X-Men. So basically, people got captured and then they escaped, but not all of them escaped, so we got to go find the ones that didn't escape. Okay, fine. So um, then we cut to this scene. And this is kind of weird because the X-Men, including teenagers, are going to be tried and executed for terrorism in Genosha, which they've tangled with a couple times. And then they have a debate <laughs> on NPR between, you know, Mora, who is essentially like a den mother of the X-Men, and this, you know, fairly, you know, uh, calm guy who's like, yeah, you know, they're terrorists. We're going to execute them. Here's where it gets crazy. This panel specifically. Now, these are, you know, uh, South Africa apartheid villains. I mean, they literally enslave people. And yet, in their candid moments between each other, they don't talk like villains. And they're not presented like villains. They're presented with people, you know, that have a point of view, that were born into a system and a society that they didn't create. They're just dealing with the hand that was dealt to them. Now, this guy literally enslaves people, so his, you know, redeemability, pretty low. But she's essentially just a soldier, you know, just serving her country. She even says, I'd rather be a policeman, you know what I mean? Like, she wishes they weren't in this constant war state that they're in. So they're dealing with, uh, um, you know, ramifications of they pissed off the X-Men. That's going to be a problem. And then uh, we get to meet Hodge. Now, Hodge is... At the time, I really didn't know about Hodge. I hadn't read the X-Factor storyline where he came from. He's just a crazy monster who hates mutants, and he's kind of entertaining. He's very, like, up, you know. He's over the top. Then we get, you know, a classic adventure stuff. We we beat up some bad guys. We got their gear, and we're using their codes to get into the uh, uh, Citadel. But then they crash because Storm is being enslaved, and her psychic connection overwhelms... Uh, Psylocke, which in turn overwhelms for a second there, Logan, and they crash. But since Logan is, you know, about that life, you know, he, he just rolls with the punches. Uh, and he's even talking at one point. She's just like, you know, he's, he says, I, I got no interest in pondering the why of things. Every life has its obligations. I just want to settle mine while I'm still able. So he's talking about, you know, she's like, when you got your claws, what he's like, I just, I had claws. So I just kind of dealt with it. Um, so uh, I uh, I never like psychic stories, <laughs> but I do like the psychic effect where you do, you know, uh, no shading. It's just a bunch of line work. So they end up in this Citadel and there's a lot of subplot stuff. Um, uh, Havoc has basically been ensorcelled. He works for them now. He's got a girlfriend and Psylocke is wearing the uniform of his girlfriend. So he's pissed off. He's like, is she hurt? Did you kill her? You get this great scene again. This art like this, you didn't get stuff like this back then. It was this was sui generis, <laughs> however you uh, pronounce that. It was not the norm at all. And so you're seeing this stuff, and it's and you know it's 1990 or whatever, and it's just blowing your mind. I mean, this is just amazing stuff. Not what you would get. I mean, this the the intensity of this struggle right here unprecedented at the time it blew our minds so we get to see some cool guns and if you're not going to draw something a bunch of times you can make it as complex as you want if this is going to be i mean look at this the way they do the the lighting and the musculature and even the hair like this was not <laughs> no it wasn't like this no we didn't get this level of quality and again this was a monthly book uh, some uh, really great uh, variety in the compositions. Uh, the camera's far away. It's close. It's constantly varying. Now, there is some stuff where it's like, this was a simpler day, so coloring was simpler, but it helped because, you know, we, we got foreground, middle ground, background. Everything kind of pops as long as you choose your colors uh, intelligently. So right here, especially this panel right here, this is very heavily... Mike Mignola influence. I mean, this just straight up looks like his style right there. And again, like I mentioned before, when things got small and you can't rely on a bunch of cross hatching and effects, you go for form. And in that case, Portacio, Lee, Liefeld, Silvestri, they all defaulted to um, 
Mike Mignola style, since that works at a very small scale. So um, I know I went through this. Uh, it, it's interesting. The pace is very fast. It's very frenetic. It's like a Michael Bay movie. But a lot of stuff happened. Like, I just reviewed this in a couple minutes, but it felt like it took me a good 20 minutes to read it. And again, I've read this dozens of times. I know the story. So it's definitely a recommend. There's going to be one more. That one is just an absolute epic. Uh, before I go, is this you graphic novel? Rock and Roll Ninja graphic novel. I'm probably going to go have dinner and then uh, record the other one and then clear out my Comixology backlog. Bye.